This was quite the come down episode of AEW Dynamite tonight coming off of Blood and Guts. Last week we saw the Elite beat the Blackpool Combat Club. An episode I thought was uh, very enjoyable. Uh, they did move some stories along on Dynamite tonight. But at the end of the day when the show was over it still felt like a filler episode to me. Feels like one of those episodes where if you missed it you come back to it next week. You didn't really miss much. Although AR Fox is a heel now. AR Fox, who doesn't appear very often on Dynamite, he was in a match tonight, and now he's a heel. Now he's part of the Mogul Embassy. So that was that was one of the bigger th things that happened on the show. That should give you an indication here of how important the show was here tonight. It was very odd to me, though, that coming off Blood and Guts, the Elite got a big win last week, that they would not have the Elite on the show. But the Blackpool Combat Club, who lost, they were all over the show. They were in backstage segments. They were running out at the end of other people's matches. They were in the main event tonight. So they were all over the place tonight. But, uh, but no elite on the show. But the bigger thing is this. you know, Now the blood and guts is out of the way. And there, is, there are still several weeks to go until we get to Wembley Stadium. But the next big AEW show is all in. They're going to have 80,000 plus people in Wembley Stadium. It's going to be the biggest show this company has ever done, right? The biggest show, literally the biggest show this company has ever produced. And you would think that at this point now, we are now in late July. The show is from tomorrow, exactly one month away. And then they have a second pay-per-view a week later, which is all out. But you would think starting this week, we would get an indication of, how to see the show. Now, we, we have a pretty good sense of how to see the show because word leaked a few weeks ago, but still nothing from AEW. As far as we know, it's a pay-per-view, but AEW still has not said anything. We don't know how to watch the show. We don't know any of the matches that are on the show. We can begin to see a, a picture forming about what matches might take place on that show. We had, for example, a comment made by MJF tonight that he is going to give Adam Cole a shot at the AEW World Championship because he knows how much it means to Adam Cole. It would stand to reason they would do that match at all in, but nothing has been officially announced yet. So that, to me, was the most, kind of the most, uh, I guess, surprising thing coming out of the show is that I would have expected some kind of announcement to start to get people excited, like really excited for that show, and there was nothing. There was nothing. Certain stories are moving in certain directions. Again, we can piece together what may or may not be happening on that show. But if you were waiting for the uh, first announcement of uh, anything all-in related, nothing. Nothing on this show. I guess we'll have to wait for next week. Next week is actually going to be the 200th episode of Dynamite. So they're promoting that as a big deal. But this is your AEW Dynamite review for July 26, 2023. I am the Solomon Monster. Like and subscribe. 350 likes is the goal tonight. A very modest goal for Be The Booker. <clears throat> if we can hit that goal, we will do that segment later on in the stream. Super chats are open. I got to give a shout out to JM. JM dropped a $100 super chat on my, on my head few minutes before I went live, I started to hear my own voice. I said, where is that coming from? I said, oh, it's coming from here. <laughs> it's me. So, JM, thank you. I'm going to be reading your message and everybody else's as we uh, get closer to the end here. 
And a uh, shout out to Lady Fire Panda as well for gifting 10 channel memberships before I even went live tonight. You guys were already better than this episode of Dynamite. Thank you. Thank you very much. Put a smile on my face. You know what I would compare it to? I was very complimentary of Monday Night Raw last week. Even, even some people attacked me for being so complimentary about Raw. But, you know, I call it like I see it. I thought last week's Raw was a very good show. This week's, not so much. This week was kind of a return to form in that respect. Last week's episode of Dynamite, I thought, was, was very enjoyable. And this week, compared to last week, not so much. So it's kind of, it's kind of similar, where I was very up on both shows last week. This week, uh, not as much enthusiasm coming out of each one. I guess we still have SmackDown and Collision. Collision is really... I feel like Collision is going to blow this show away. Uh, frankly, Collision has been blowing most of their other shows away. But Collision is clearly going to be the big show of the week this week. They're going to have MJF and Adam Cole challenging for the tag team titles on Saturday. they got a big ladder match with Andrade and Buddy Matthews. That is going to be the big AEW show on Saturday night. It will not be Dynamite. Well, let's talk about this Dynamite show. Kick things off here at the... Uh, very beginning here. They kicked the show off as they have many times before this year with Orange Cassidy defending his international championship. This time it was against AR Fox. AR Fox does not make very many appearances here on Dynamite, but he did get a contract many months ago. We got stars galore. We got stars galore. Uh, you're going to see a show like never before. The mission is the titles and we will win, but we're all going to rock WrestleMania 2. Hey, JM with the $60 men on a mission super chat. And here I thought that Taz singing Gravity by John Mayer was going to be the weirdest Thing on the uh, show tonight that I was going to talk about, but then you get me singing. I actually think I'm a better singer than Taz, so at least I have that going for me. JM, thank you for that 60. You pulled a Tony Khan on us with the music intro tonight. You know, I know people were, were getting very nostalgic for Racing Queen. I haven't played it in a while. I usually get popped for it when I do. So actually, I will tell you, I, I do appreciate the Super Chats because I am sure, <laughs> probably by using that song tonight, I'm probably not getting any ad money on this video. So your Super Chats are most appreciated. Yes, I hope you enjoyed the Racing Queen intro. Actually, I think, yeah, I think the uh, the shirt, I think the shirt match. I think that was the same shirt. Anyway, AR Fox and Orange Cassidy international title kicked off the show. Actually, before we even get to the match, we had a video package. We had a video package on the history between Darby Allen and A.R. Fox. And it would become clear later in the show why they were setting this up with a video package. Even though Darby Allen, he was not part of this match, but if you remember last week, he went to bat for A.R. Fox. He went to Orange Cassidy and said, look, do me a solid. This guy, he helped train me. He gave me a place to live when I was homeless and I had nowhere to go and I was coming up in the business. Give him a shot at your international championship. That's why we got this match on this show tonight. So in the video, again, Darby is explaining that he was living in his car. He was training at the time with AR Fox. And Fox found out that Darby was living in his car. And he said, look, you're going to come stay with me. Rent free. Didn't even charge him or anything. So he gave him a place to live. He goes, that's the kind of person that AR Fox is. Kind of like uh, CM Punk buying Joey, uh, who was it? Uh, Joey Mercury. Right? He bought his house. He bought Joey Mercury's house. So anyway, he was, uh, he was very kind to Darby. Darby never forgot that. He said that uh, there might not be a Darby Allen today were it not for AR Fox. And this is a really good opener. I thought it was a really good opening match for the finish. Uh, Fox missed the top row 450. Looked like he maybe tweaked his ankle. Uh, it was part of the match. I don't think he, he tweaked it for real. But that allowed Cassidy to wrench at it, get the mousetrap, and he got the win to retain his championship, as he has done 26 times previously. This was title defense number 27 for Orange Cassidy, and he remains the international champion, as he will, I'm sure, for many years to come. I mean, the, the run that this guy is on. 
he's going to end up having a Roman Reigns run as the international champion. So when the match is over, he takes his sunglasses and he puts them on AR Fox and they're posing together in the ring and it's this happy moment. And with Orange Cassidy looking straight ahead at the, the crowd or the hard camera, whatever he was looking at, he's got his back turned to AR Fox. And we see AR Fox take off the sunglasses and he snaps them in half. And when Orange Cassidy turns around, A.R. Fox blasted him in the face with a forearm shot. As Fox went to go leave, Darby Allen walks out and he's pissed. And he very angrily confronts Fox on the ramp. He shoves him. What are you doing? I went to bat for you. I got you this match. He says, uh, I vouch for you. And A.R. Fox didn't really have an answer. He kind of threw his hands up in the air and he walked away. We cut back, so that was, you know, mildly interesting. You wonder, where is this going? Of course, you put two and two together, you know Darby is wrestling Swerve later in the show, and you should have seen where this was going. They cut back to the ring, and Orange Cassidy, he's trying to get back to his feet, trying to shake off what just happened. And they have a tight camera shot, and they're lingering on him. So that's a sign right there. Somebody is about to attack, right? We don't know who, but somebody clearly is about to attack. And then you hear the crowd kind of rising. So you know somebody is coming. We can't see who it is. The somebody who uh, attacked was John Moxley. And he attacked Cassidy. He laid him out with a death rider. Moxley attacked Cassidy as far as why. Why would he do this? After the Ring of Honor World title match, I know not everybody watches Ring of Honor. I barely watch Ring of Honor, but their pay-per-views are usually excellent. So I did see the two main events from Death Before Dishonor last week, both of which were excellent. Claudio defended his title against Pac, and in the main event on that show, the first ever women's main event for a Ring of Honor pay-per-view, I think a Ring of Honor major show ever, Athena retained her women's championship over Willow Nightingale. Willow has been on a, uh, a nice little run for herself recently. Uh, even winning the New Japan Strong Women's title before she dropped it to Julia. Would have been nice to see her on the show tonight. We'll talk about the women and the uh, the sign later in the show. But he attacked Cassidy because after the Claudio match, when he retained with an assist from Yuta, a bunch of people ran in. Lucha Brothers ran in. They were getting beaten down. Best friends and Orange Cassidy ran in. And Orange Cassidy gave Claudio an orange so this was payback for what he did to Claudio after the ROH title match last week. That combined with the fact that later in the show, we were getting Moxley and Claudio as tag team partners against the Lucha Brothers and the Best Friends. Orange Cassidy obviously is connected to the Best Friends, and so that's why Moxley ran out and did what he did. So that was the opening segment. I, you know, the, the post-match is what the post-match is, but the match itself, I thought, was very good. We go backstage, and Renee is with Chris Jericho and Don Callis. After Callis requested this time to speak with Jericho, he said, no pressure. He's trying not to pressure Jericho into making a decision about whether or not he's going to join the Callis family, but he's taken the liberty, he says, of arranging a tag team match where Chris Jericho will be tag team partners with Kanosuke Takeshita. And Jericho said... Sure, yeah, I'm willing to give it a try. Why not? Kala said, the best part are your opponents. Your opponents are going to be Sammy Guevara and Daniel Garcia. Of course, Sammy and Daniel are part of the JAS. So Jericho was taken aback by this development. And Callis reminded him that he said, you know, you did say you wanted to see these guys spread their wings on their own. And so Jericho thought about it a little bit. Why and he is said, Sonny right, Monster he, a punk hater? Why he was does okay he hate punk so much? What did he ever do to him? <sighs> oh, Solomon. Am I wearing the same fucking shirt in that one, too? This is just a total coincidence. I guess uh, there it is. What is that? Bobbert reviews with the $40 super chat. Solemn Monster, the CM Punk hater. <sighs> Even though I just put punk over on the podcast on Sunday, I said he outclassed The Rock on the microphone before their matches in 2013, which he did, by the way. And yeah, it's funny on that. Some people came back at me and said, yeah, well, Rock couldn't be Rock 
because it's PG now, so it's not fair. If you really think about that for a second, think about what you're saying. You're saying that Rock is incapable of evolving and doing anything other, th other than the shtick that he was doing in the late 90s and the early 2000s. It's, it's not exactly the, uh, the, the flex you think it is to say that, yeah, well, Rock couldn't do the same shit that he was doing 20 years ago, so therefore it's not fair. If you put Punk in the ring with that Rock, it would be very different. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. Doesn't change the fact that he was still outclassed. So I was sticking up for Punk this weekend, but yes. Don't don't let the cat out of the bag. I am a uh, I am a punk hater apparently. Hey Bobber, thank you, man. I appreciate that. So Don Callis had one more surprise for Chris Jericho. He said that he had a gift for him, and this was he said. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago when the two of them were in the ring together, they pitched it up to the the, the Tron, and they showed footage of the Tony Condello show from Canada back in '95 when. A very young Don Callis and Jericho were in the same promotion together. They were in the ring with Bad, uh, I think Bad News Allen was there. So, in tribute to that, he presented a painting to Chris Jericho. He had a painting commissioned. Now, this is not the first time that we've seen this because there was a painting of uh, Callis and Omega, if you remember that one. So, he had a painting commissioned of the two of them shirtless with a smiling Bad News Allen in the background hovering above them. This is not true to life. Bad News Allen was smiling in the painting. When was the last time you saw Bad News Allen crack a smile? I never did. I don't think I ever saw that man smile once in all the times I saw him on TV. Jericho appreciated the gesture. He said, though, uh, it's really big, though. And Callus told him, don't worry about it, I've got the perfect place for it. And he walked off. Might as well move to Chicago. No, I think I'll stay in New York. If I'm going to move, I'm going to get out of the city. I'm not going to move to another, another city with all kinds of noise and crime and pollution. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go somewhere completely different. Somewhere where there isn't snow. Ideally, it would be someplace where there isn't really a winter to speak of. So uh, leave your suggestions in the chat. Claudio and Yuta were in the back. We had another backstage segment here. They cut a PSA telling us, uh, telling kids not to play with fire and telling the kids in AEW not to mess with the Blackpool Combat Club. Claudio said the beating that Pac suffered at death before dishonor is nothing compared to what he would get when they cross paths again. And he made it very clear that the issues between them were only just beginning. John Moxley then walked in. He gave a warning to the Lucha Bros and best friends, who he said will pay for Pac's mistake. So again, already only a couple segments into the show, and it's like the Blackpool Combat Club, like what the Judgment Day is to WWE right now is what the Blackpool Combat Club was. <laughs> On this show tonight, they were all over the place. Tony Schiavone was in the ring to introduce the brand new FTW champion, Jack Perry, who walked out to Beethoven with a Hook t-shirt. Now, Hook has a t-shirt that literally just says the word Hook on it. You've seen that shirt before, probably. But on the shirt that Jungle Boy was wearing, it had the word Hook, but then the words, I beat in orange, orange lettering right above it. So it said, I beat Hook. So he gets into the ring, and this was weird because it felt like they were expecting this reaction to be more, uh, well, they were expecting this reaction to be louder than it was. I think they were expecting him to come out and get like Dominic Mysterio level heat or, you know, Dan Lambert level heat. And he really didn't. It was actually pretty quiet. And it was almost like at the beginning of the promo, they were trying to coax the booze out of the crowd. So I don't quite think that they were uh, reacting in the way that, that, that maybe they wanted to or wanted the fans to. But he said he beat Hook, and then he realized after that first loss, Hook realized that he can't hang with the big boys. And when he said he was going to win himself a championship, he said he sure as hell wasn't talking about this one. Tony Schiavone made a comment on here about, 
you must be happy now. You talked about winning a world championship. I said, did he win a world championship recently and I missed it? Because that ain't no fucking world championship. So I don't know what the hell he was saying. He was a world tag team champion. <laughs> that was a long time ago. But he's no world champion now. I have no idea what Tony was referring to there. He said this title, the FTW title, was created in a second-class company. It's never been recognized, but as soon as he put his hands on it, it became the real deal. He said he's the greatest wrestler to ever get within 100 feet of this thing. And then he grabbed the mic away from Shivani. He looked over at Taz, who was sitting on stage at the announce desk, and he told him that he would run circles around him and all of his dirtbag friends back in the day. Can you imagine Jungle Boy? In the original ECW, they would eat him alive. <laughs> they would eat this kid alive and leave a little bit for dessert at the end of the night. I'm trying to picture like a baby face. Actually, maybe a heel would be even better. Okay, baby face or a heel. Jack Perry, you know, this pretty boy coming into ECW at the ECW arena back in the day. So he tells Taz, yeah, he would run circles around him and all of his friends. And right on cue, as he says this, who should come walking out but Jerry Lynn, former ECW World Heavyweight Champion who works behind the scenes as an agent or producer in AEW. Jerry Lynn walks out, and he's got a mic in his hand. And he gets in the ring, and he says, in ECW, they paved the way for this younger generation. He told Jack to keep running his mouth, and he will get his ass kicked. Jack said that he would like to see it. And so Jerry drops the mic. We got a mic drop from Jerry Lynn. And Jack says, look, I I'm obviously not dressed for a fight. He was wearing, you know, basically like a, a tank top and shorts. Obviously, he says, I'm not dressed for a fight. So they're going to do this on his time, he says. He said, how about next week you come down to my ring and we'll see who gets their ass kicked. I thought this was a very lame segment. I, I just didn't work for me. Didn't work for me. I don't think they got the kind of heat they were hoping for at the beginning of it. But, you know, Jerry Lynn coming out, and, and I don't know. I just thought this came off uh, very lame. Now, Jerry Lynn is one of the better in-ring workers of his uh, generation. The matches he had with RVD are some of the best matches in ECW history. The work that Jerry Lynn did even in WCW back in the Mr. JL days, right? No, no one will doubt. Uh, what kind of, of talent that Jerry Lynn is. Uh, but he also hasn't wrestled in 10 years. He has retirement match in 2013. And he just did an interview, as a matter of fact, earlier this year, only a matter of months ago. Uh, it was one of these uh, virtual signings. And he said that while he would love to have one more match, it cannot happen. It cannot happen. It will not happen. His neck will not allow it. He's got permanent nerve damage. So... Anybody expecting an actual match next week is going to be very disappointed because we are not going to get an actual match between these two. Uh, it'll be more of an angle. I mean, look, that's why later in the show when they were hyping this up, they're, they're hyping it up now as a face-to-face. -face. They specifically said face-to-face. -face. So at the end of this segment, you would think we're getting a match next week, uh, but then they, they made it clear that it's not going to be a match and because he can't take bumps. Maybe he can get pushed. He can get shoved. But Jerry Lynn can't take bumps. He can't have a match. So it'll probably be more of an angle, probably with Hook, you know, running out and chasing Jack off. And, well, Jack off. I swear I didn't do that on purpose. But that probably is what's going to happen next week. And we'll see. We'll see if it's just a one-off with Jerry Lynn or they're going to start trotting out a whole bunch of ECW legends to... You know, try to defend the honor of ECW like we haven't seen that before. And come out and go face-to-face -face with Jack. I mean, they have other people. I, I don't know that there are very many left. And the ones that are, I think, are tied up elsewhere. Either to WWE Legends deals, or they were in Impact Wrestling, or these other places. You know, Tommy Dreamer and people like that. Because otherwise, who's left? You know, like, who who's left? RVD is the biggest name I could think of. Yeah, I could see them maybe working out a deal to bring in RVD for a one-shot. RVD against the Jungle Boy, maybe? I mean, who else is there? You got Tajiri. You could always fly him in. You got Sabu. 
We already saw him. He came in for that quick payday a few months ago. Tony Khan's a huge Sabu mark. If he paid Sabu enough, I'm sure Sabu would come in and he would do a match. I don't want to see it. So I don't know. I don't know if this is going to be a recurring theme with uh, more ECW names being brought in. But as far as this segment goes, I just thought this segment came off pretty lame. So then we had Pac against the man who forgot him, Gravity. I'm convinced that this match was booked just so people can make that stupid joke. It's the only reason this match was booked. Gravity, for those who don't know, is the younger brother of Bandito, former Ring of Honor world champion who had surgery recently for a broken wrist, so we're not going to see him for a while. Pac tried to, at the beginning of this, he tried to reintroduce himself to Gravity, because for those who don't know, for years, Pac was referred to back even in his, uh, in his Neville days in WWE as the man that Gravity forgot. So he was trying to reintroduce himself to Gravity here at the beginning of this match, before they finally started actually wrestling. Taz, this is where Taz briefly on commentary uh, serenaded us with a, a very brief rendition of John Mayer's Gravity, which is something I was not expecting. By the way, somebody mentioned Landstorm in the chat. Landstorm works for Impact Wrestling. Landstorm is a producer behind the scenes for Impact, so he would be unavailable. He would be a good choice, but he would be unavailable. Nice try, though. I said this, fewer and fewer of them. Most of them have died off. Think about all the big ECW names and the ECW originals that were left, right? A lot of them died. Some of them aren't even, I mean, I don't know what Spike Dudley is up to these days. He'd be about Jungle Boy's size. Could always bring in him. Little Guido. <laughs> I mean, who are they, they going to bring in? If not an RVD or a Sabu, right? Taz, Taz could do an angle. I, don't, I mean, Taz is never going to do a match. Would Taz get in the ring and go face-to-face -face with Jungle Boy? Would Taz, you know, get physical and take a bump? I don't know that he would take a bump, because his neck is also fucked. Every one of their necks is fucked. That's all they did in ECW, was they killed themselves. It's amazing that they could even walk on their own two feet. So again, you have a very small pool of... of oh, Sandman. Don't, don't, don't even get me started. <laughs> Sandman. Yeah, that's, that's what we need on this show. We need the fucking Sandman on Dynamite. That's, that's the last thing we need. Anyway, after Taz's stirring rendition of John Mayer, they cut to the Blackpool Combat Club. They were watching the match from their locker room, paying very close attention. Both men went to the top, Pac connected with an avalanche brain buster, and won the match with his brutalizer submission, uh, Look, we got some fancy footwork here from Gravity. I've seen enough fancy footwork recently from the likes of Vikingo and Commander, so what I saw here from Gravity was nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, but this was mostly a dominant showing for Pac to get him back in the win column after last week. He walked out of the Blood and Guts match. He lost to Claudio at Death Before Dishonor. So this was a way to get him back in the, uh, in the win column this week. Now, I was looking forward to seeing what they were going to do on this show with MJF and Adam Cole, because they have been the most entertaining part of the show now for weeks. And unfortunately, all we got from them this week was a nothing live, and there were no funny skits or anything like that. We just got a backstage segment with Renee from last week, we were told. They weren't even there live tonight. So in the back last week with Renee, we got an interview, because they are going to be challenging FTR for the AEW World Tag Team titles on Collision this Saturday. Won the Blind Eliminator Tournament last week. That gave them the right to challenge for the tag team title. So that's coming up this weekend. So Renee is uh, back there with them. Cole goes to speak. And MJF immediately cuts him off and said FTR's peak was during the pinnacle. Because if you remember, they were all part of the pinnacle together. It was MJF. It was Wardlow. What the hell happened to that guy, by the way? It was FTR, it was Sean Spears and Tully Blanchard. They had a good thing going with the Pinnacle. I don't even remember how it all ended. I think it just it just ended. <laughs> there was no real conclusion to it. So there, there's a ball dropped. But he said that was their peak. Their peak was during the Pinnacle. And then MJF mocked Dax Harwood by calling him Mr. Clean and Yosemite Sam. 
And then he mocked him for repeatedly saying that he loves the business and he loves his wife and he loves his daughter. And he did a great, I'm not even going to attempt to do it, <laughs> but he did a great uh, Dax Harwood accent during this promo that you should go listen to. He said that he would punch Harwood so hard that he would spit out CM Punk's jockstrap, which is the first time we've heard MJF acknowledge the name CM Punk on television since CM Punk came back. We've heard Punk mention him even indirectly a couple of times on Collision so far, but this is the first MJF mention of Punk since he came back. Adam Cole said never in a million years did he expect that he would be friends with MJF, and he said he has nothing to worry about as far as him touching the AEW World title the way he did after the match last week. That's what got MJF so upset when he turned around that he saw Cole holding his championship, and all of a sudden it looked like things were going to fall apart between these two. He told him, you got nothing to worry about as far as that goes. Cole said that when the tag team tournament began, it was all about winning the gold. And Cole said it's become now about friendship. He told MJF that he has, well, he told MJF rather, that not only did he find a friend in him, and a close friend, he considers MJF to be one of his very best friends. We already have best friends in this company. But he's talking about an actual best friend. MJF, he was he was taken aback by this. And he said, you know what? Win, lose, or draw. He wants Adam Cole to know that he's going to give him a rematch. He's going to give him a shot at the AEW World Champion. It's not really a, a rematch, right? Their first match was an eliminator match, I believe. But he's going to give him a match for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship because he knows how much it means to Adam Cole. So this was a little twist that I, I was not expecting. We all knew what the destination was going to be. We all know that at the end of all this, and I hope they can keep this going for a long time, it would be nice for Tony Khan to extend this out as long as possible because it's just been an entertaining part of the show, and I would hate for him to prematurely blow the whole thing up. But we know how this ends. Whoever's the baby face, whoever's the heel, we know that these two are eventually going to meet, either at all in or all out, and they're going to have a match for the championship. But I was not expecting MJF to volunteer a title shot to Adam Cole. So that was, that was a surprise. As soon as he says this, though, Roderick Strong storms in. Still in his neck brace, which is quickly becoming his his uh, D'Lo Brown chest protector, is what this neck brace is fast becoming for Roderick Strong. And he shoved MJF. And MJF, and it was so quick, and it was like a, such a commotion. Maybe some people didn't didn't hear him say this. I heard him say this though, and this was this was my favorite part of the entire show. So after Roddy pushes him. MJF looks at him, and he calls Roderick Strong a default call. I, fucking, I love that line. I fucking, I almost fucking died. He called him a default call. And the reason it's so funny is because it's true. It's true. If you go into, to go into 2K23 or whatever, any wrestling game, and go create a wrestler, and you'll see someone that probably looks like Roderick Strong. And if you wanted to point to some big thing he's done so far in the time he's been in this company, which hasn't been that long, but he really, I mean, the biggest thing I could think of is he had the false count anywhere match with Chris Jericho that I loved on Dynamite, right? And he beat Jericho outside the building. Otherwise, I can't tell you a single fucking thing this guy has done since he came to this company. A default call. Every time I see him now, that's the first thing I'm going to think of. This guy is a default creator wrestler in a video game. So Roddy told Cole, look, you can't trust this guy. And Cole told MJF, you know, you want, I, let me talk to Roddy. So it was just the two of them. And Cole told him that he loves him like a brother, but Roddy is acting crazy and he's pushing him away. And that was basically how the segment ended. So we got the great line from MJF. And we got the, again, surprising, I think, twist of him offering a title match to... Adam Cole. So now the question is, you know, where where do they go from here? Where are they going with this? Because there are a lot of different possibilities for how this could go down. Even if we know where the destination is, 
we don't know what route they're going to take. Right? The GPS might tell you three or four different ways you can go. There are probably three or four different ways that they could go with this story. The most predictable sort of straight line that they could go in would be to have MJF turn on Adam Cole at the end of all this. Like he's convinced Cole that he's genuine in how he feels about him. And then like Ric Flair turning on Sting back in the day, as he did many times, he lowers the boom, no pun intended for Adam Cole, and we get the title match out of it, right? Or, or just a simple turn, one guy turns on the other, right? But Roddy is the wild card here, because clearly whatever is going to happen is going to involve him. They're not involving him in these segments every week like this unless there's going to be some kind of big payoff involving Roderick Strong. The obvious thing for me, we have a big tag team title match coming up on Saturday. Roddy obviously doesn't trust MJF. He obviously doesn't believe that Adam Cole can see what's going on here. So Roderick Strong is going to cost them the tag team titles on Saturday. Because I still feel FTR is going to win. How are they going to win, though? Is it going to be a clean win? Is it going to be a miscommunication between MJF and Cole? Because it's still too early to break them up. You know, they have a miscommunication during the match. That's where it all falls apart. But what if Roderick Strong gets involved? Even if it's just a distraction. It probably would be something as simple as a distraction. Roddy, what are you doing here? Get out of here. And Adam Cole turns around, walks right into a shatter machine, and gets pinned. That's the kind of finish I see going down on Saturday. So FTR retains, and then it kind of pushes the story forward involving these three, including Roddy. If that doesn't happen, then he may end up costing Adam Cole the world championship. When MJF eventually gives him that title match he promised him, it'll be Roderick Strong who ends up costing Adam Cole. Or maybe there's a big twist at the end, and instead of costing Adam Cole, he actually helps Adam Cole beat MJF to win the championship, and then we find out, you were never my best friend. You're a fucking slime ball. We were playing you this entire time, and we get a double turn. With MJF actually becoming babyface and Adam Cole being the heel. Seems less likely to me, but that's another way they could go with it. It would be weird to turn MJF now when you know that they're preparing to eventually do MJF and CM Punk. Um, but I, I'm intrigued by the possibility that when we get to Punk and MJF at some point down the road... And who knows when they're going to do that match. I mean, it may not be Chicago at All Out. It could be even later. You know, Maybe Tony Khan's not planning on doing it until early next year. But this time it's MJF as the babyface and CM Punk as the heel going into that match. Uh, I don't know. I don't know because Ricky Starks on Collision is the one who they're teasing is, is going to be a heel, right? Not Punk. I don't think they're going to turn Punk if they're turning Ricky Starks. So... I don't know where they're going to go with this. And that's part of what I like about this story is that there's a few different directions. Some of them are more intriguing than others. But the one thing I do know is that I would like for them to keep the story going for at least the next month. Uh, there's no need to break these two up anytime soon. And frankly, you could probably even find a way to extend it beyond All In and All Out. You know, by MJF offering Adam Cole a championship match, in a way, it's kind of perfect. Because now it takes away the need to split them up and break them up before then. Before, you know, I was thinking about it as, okay, who's turning on who? And that gets us to the title match. But now you've ruined this, this great union between these two. Him offering him as a friend a shot at the championship takes away the need for them to turn on the other. So they could keep this going for a few more months if they want to. I think that probably would be the ideal scenario, to be honest with you. But Roddy is the wild card here. Rod Roddy is going to end up playing a role in all this. and Who's going to turn on who, I guess, is uh, the ultimate question here. But this has become the, uh, the best story, the best story going in AEW, the one that I find the most interesting anyway. So we also got footage from Renee's backstage interview last week. She did one with FTR as well. Cash Wheeler said that he genuinely likes Adam Cole. He's sorry he's been dragged into this whole thing. He said MJF calls himself a generational talent, but he's really a generational ass kisser. And Wheeler said that he likes Cole, but they have to show MJF not to mess with FTR. 
Harwood took issue with them making a mockery of pro wrestling with the dance stuff, you know, the comedy stuff that they were doing last week. Harwood said that he was going to beat the shit out of MJF, and then he apologized. He said, my daughter is watching, even though they bleeped the word. He apologized. He said that he would rip MJF's eyeballs out if he said something about his wife and his daughter. Great. Then we can get more eyeball stories on uh, future seasons of Dark Side of the Ring, because we haven't gotten enough of those. Dark Side of the Ring, Tales from the Territories. There are plenty of plenty of eyeball stories. Wrestlers uh, gouging and ripping each other's eyeballs out. So that's exactly what we need. We need another one. But this was fine. You know, as far as dueling promos here to get people pumped up for the tag team match on, uh, on Saturday. Yeah, FTR is very good at this sort of old school. It's a very basic old school wrestling promo. I mean, there's nothing you know, overly special about what they said here on this show. But Dax was showing some good fire here because of the comments that MJF made and, you know, threatening to rip the man's eyeballs out. This this match on Saturday, it's going to be very interesting to see what the collision number is going to be. The collision number this past weekend went up. I think they were back around 600,000 viewers. But they're really pushing this match very hard. Last week's collision show on paper, it's, it's just weird because the show on paper had nothing. Nothing. They had the House of Black defending the tag team uh, trios belts against the acclaimed and Billy Gunn. That was the biggest thing that was advertised ahead of time for the show last week. And you would think, if anything, the number might go down, and it didn't go down. This show, this coming Saturday, is being pushed pretty hard with a big tag team title match, so... Very curious to see how that showed. I don't know what the sports competition is like this Saturday. Uh, I know I'm going to be gone during the day on Saturday, which probably means I will not be live. But uh, obviously, I'll catch it when I get home. But uh, yeah, very curious to see what that number ends up being. So up next, we had Darby Allen. One-on-one with Swerve Strickland. Darby had Nick Wayne, who just made his debut only a few weeks ago, 18 years old. Wrestled Swerve Strickland. Swerve had Prince Nana in his corner representing the Mogul Embassy. These two have had a lot of matches together, not only in AEW, but also in uh, the Defy wrestling promotion. So they're very familiar with each other as far as uh, working together. Swerve kicked out of the Last Supper, which I don't know that I have seen anybody kick out of that before. I, I'm sure someone has. I just cannot off the top of my head think of who that who that was or who that would be. Usually it's one of those things, it's kind of like the mouse trap that Orange Cassidy uses, where when he uses it, he usually beats his opponent with it. But Swerve kicked out, and Excalibur on commentary said that Darby's beaten him with it in their matches before, so Swerve had the move scouted, he said. Strickland rolled to the apron, Darby speared him through the ropes, and in doing so, he came straight down on the back of his own neck. It looked like he came down on the, on the top of his head. Initially, when I looked at it, then they showed a replay, and he, he kind of tucked his head and landed on the back of his neck. It wasn't moving. He was completely just prone on the floor. A referee came outside to make sure he was still alive, and he could feel his limbs, which thankfully he could. But I mean, right on the back of his neck. Good Lord. And then when he got up, he hit another, another dive through the ropes on the opposite side of the ring. And this time, when he launched himself through the ropes... Swerve caught him with a knee strike in midair. Just wrecked him with a knee in midair. And again, Darby was out on the ground. Darby Allen is not going to have a very long career. I know this is not exactly breaking news, but he's not. He's not going to have a very long career. So he may as well get his shit in while he still can. Back inside, Strickland hit a swerve stomp off the top, but Darby kicked out. Both men went up top. Darby got an avalanche over the top stunner which sent Strickland rolling to the apron. Darby wanted a coffin drop, but Strickland pulled out the feet from underneath. He hit a very dangerous-looking Death Valley driver from the middle rope onto the edge of the ring. So both men were on the floor. Darby almost got counted out. And Nick Wayne came over to him on that side of the ring, was rooting him on, trying to get him back up. The referee reached a count of nine before Darby got himself back in just in time to break the count, but just as Darby dove, and he didn't dive totally into the ring, just kind of halfway in to make sure he broke the count, at that moment, 
somebody came out of the crowd wearing a hoodie, and we could kind of tell who it was. It was AR Fox. We could tell Taz on commentary said, oh, I know who that is, just based on the gear that he was wearing, even though he had the hoodie on. But here's, here's the issue with this. So Darby breaks the count, and AR Fox comes out of the crowd to grab Darby and attack Darby. Nick Wayne is right there. Now, I don't know. It may have just been a case where Nick Wayne was not supposed to be in that exact position at that exact moment because all of a sudden, Nick Wayne, who clearly saw someone come out from the crowd and go after Darby instead of going and stopping this person, he runs around to the other side of the ring. I guess he was chasing after Prince Nana or something. But it looked incredibly stupid because he was still standing there and he clearly saw this person attacking Darby and he ran away instead of helping him out. So it looks stupid. And again, it just may have been a case of him being in the wrong position. He's young. Who knows? But it looked ridiculous. But he ran Darby into the ring post and then back in the ring. Swerve connected with the JML driver. And he got the pin. So Swerve Strickland, a much needed win, even though uh, he needed help in doing it. A much needed win for Swerve Strickland here in this match. AR Fox got in the ring after to put the beat down on Darby and on Nick Wayne when he came in. Prince Nana then presented a mogul embassy shirt to AR Fox, who put the shirt on. This was the best match of the entire night, I thought, and you had to see that finish coming after the events post-match, after the opener, what happened at the beginning of the show. You had to know that AR Fox was going to come back out. He was going to be a factor in this match, which he was. As far as uh, AR Fox joining the Mogul Embassy, because now he's a heel, he was a babyface before, and, and a lot of the moves that he does, it's a very babyface style. You know, he does a lot of aerial, you know, impressive stuff in the ring that usually gets uh, a good reaction from the crowd. It's not really a style that lends itself to a heel. Uh, but I guess everybody does these types of moves now, whether they're a heel or a babyface, it doesn't really seem to matter. Uh, I, I, get the, I get the sense sometimes, and this is not about AR Fox, but I, I get the sense sometimes that I, I, gotta, I gotta be careful how I phrase this. That you know, they've, they've lost sight of, of, of how pro wrestling should be. I have noticed in recent years that it seems to be more about how many fancy moves can we hit to pop the crowd, regardless of whether or not the person is a babyface or a heel? Because think about it, right? It would make more sense for somebody who wrestles like Vikingo. Let's just take him as an example. And the style that he works, right, is meant to get a reaction from the crowd. All the stuff, all the incredible things that he does in that ring, right? He's an incredible athlete. But when you have people who are heels and they're supposed to be booed and hated by the crowd and they're doing all of these very impressive moves and these top rope walks and these flips and dives and all sorts of stuff, people are not going to boo that. You know, they're going to cheer it and they're going to go, oh, this is awesome and fight forever and all that. And it's, it's still weird to me, even though everybody does it, that we have heels who wrestle like that. You know what a heel should do? The heel should go to the top rope and tease doing a 450 splash and then go, fuck you, I'm not going to do it. And then just drop an elbow or a double axe handle. And there are some heels who will do that. But, I don't know, it, should, it, it feels like they have uh, just gotten away from what, what wrestling should be. You know, why do, we, why do we have heels who wrestle that style? It's like they're just interested in getting the reaction. You know, they want to get the pop from the crowd. And it's like, all right, I guess that's the way wrestling is now. But it's what happens when you're addicted to the this is awesome chant. You know, I feel like there's a lot, there's a lot of people that go out there, and that's really all they're interested in. It's not a matter of good guy against bad guy, heel against face. And uh, I kind of wish it would get a little, a little more back to the way it was because that made more sense. But... What do I know? Anyway, I, I don't mind him joining the Mogul Embassy because, to me, this is the Lucha Underground reunion. This is a Lucha Underground reunion that I can get behind. We got Dante Fox, right? And we got Swerve. There you go. We got Killshot and Dante Fox. If you know, you know. If you don't know, you need to go back and catch up with Lucha Underground.
That's what you need to do. So I don't mind it. Now, Renee was backstage with some of the members of the Jericho Appreciation Society. In the hallway outside of Chris Jericho's dressing room, we saw Matt Menard, Angelo Parker, Anna Jay, and Ty Conti. And they were waiting for Jericho to arrive. So Jericho walks up and he tells them all, come on in. So they all go into uh, Jericho's lock, <laughs> Solomonster drive through Back in my day. It doesn't make me wrong. Doesn't make me wrong. Tell me when I'm telling lies. Everything I'm saying makes sense, right? Just common sense. So they go into Jericho's dressing room. And the painting that Don Callis had presented to him earlier is hanging up on the wall. And they all see it. And Jericho tells them, don't, don't forget, but don't worry about that. He goes, how's the baby? He asked Ty Conti, how's the baby? And she said, the baby is fine, but she wanted to know what's going on with you. And Parker then pulled out his comb, that stupid comb that he has, and he said, you know, you gave this to me. He said he wasn't going to give it back to him yet. He said their crew means the world to him, and he thinks it means the same to Jericho, but he's not entirely sure anymore. Anna Jay said that Jericho is being selfish and said that they've spent all this time appreciating him and he doesn't appreciate them. She said, like Jake Hager did recently, that they can't give him 100%. And all of them, except Matt Menard, exited the room. The last parting shot we got was Menard and Jericho face-to-face, -face, and Menard told him to figure things out fast. And then he walked out. So next week is going to tell the tale of what happens next uh, when they do that tag team match? It'll be Jericho and Takeshita against Sammy and Daniel Garcia, neither of whom were on the show tonight. No, no Sammy Guevara, no Daniel Garcia. Uh, but that will tell the tale as far as whether or not Jericho is going to join the Callis family. So I wonder if that means that, because I don't think he is. I don't think Jericho is joining with Don Callis. So I wonder then if that means Jericho turns babyface out of this or if the entire JAS as a result uh, goes babyface or if they just go back to doing what they were doing before because I, I said from the beginning of all this when it looked like maybe they were actually going to break this group up and, and they're still teasing that but they're teasing it so much that I don't think it's actually going to happen and I wish it would because I think this whole JAS thing has run its course just like the inner circle they got a nice long run out of the inner circle and they ran it into the ground. It ran its course. It should have ended long before it did. It was to the point where it really wasn't benefiting anybody anymore except maybe Jericho. And I feel like we've reached that point with the JAS as well. So I, I'm kind of still hoping that out of all of this, even if Jericho doesn't join Callus, that you know, they kind of just let everybody kind of go their own way and do their own thing, and, and Jericho can find something else to do. Because uh, I've been over this whole thing now for a while. But, you know, if and when he does turn down Don Callis, it would make sense to set up for a Jericho Takeshita match. Uh, and you do Jericho and Takeshita. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking ahead. We have two big shows coming up at the end of next month, right? August 27th, we have All In. And then a week later, we have All Out. Who is Jericho going to face? For a while there, it looked like they were setting up for a singles match between Jericho and Sting. And then they basically gave us the match. They gave it away for, for free on Dynamite. It was a tag match, a tornado tag, but we got a lot of interaction between Sting and Jericho, enough that I don't have to see it now. And so they've moved away from that. We haven't even seen Sting on television since the... Now that I think about it, since that horrifying dive off the ladder where it looked like he knocked all of his fucking teeth out, uh, I don't think we've seen Sting since. So he's out of the picture for now. I, I know he was, uh, not that long ago, talking about looking forward to going to Wembley Stadium and being there. So I, I would expect him to be on the show. I don't know what he'll be doing. Probably a tag match. Uh, but Takeshita and Jericho at All In, and then maybe Takeshita and Kenny Omega at All Out, because I still think Omega and Will Ospreay 3 is probably the direction for Wembley Stadium. So you could do Omega and Osprey on the 27th, and then a week later you do Omega 
and Takeshita, because we still haven't gotten that match between those two. We had a little bit of inter interplay between them in the Blood and Guts match last week, but I want Jer I want uh, Omega and Takeshita one-on-one. -on -one. So it's just a matter of what show do you do it on. You could do Jericho and Takeshita first. You know, and that would be a big win for, for Takeshita because under no circumstances should Chris Jericho be beating that man. So Takeshita, he beats Jericho. Omega perhaps loses to Osprey in the third match. He needs a, a comeback win. Omega then beats Takeshita in Chicago at All Out. Maybe that's how that works out. We'll see. Again. No matches have been announced for either show yet. So this is all just fantasy booking until Tony Khan announces at least one match for the show. We had Dr. Britt Baker DMD against Taya Valkyrie. There was an ugly road to Valhalla uh, before the picture. There was a, a, a really it was a road to Valhalla botch before the picture in picture break where Britt just sort of fell down face first, and then there was maybe a, a second or two delay before Taya then kind of went down with her. And Taya tried to save it by raining down strikes on her heading into the break. I, I'm not sure that she was supposed to hit the move, but whatever it was that they were going for, it did not look good. It did not look good. So we come back later in the match. Britt wanted a Panama Sunrise. Valkyrie, though, countered into a Northern Light suplex. Britt did eventually get the Panama Sunrise for two. She took too long, though, putting on her glove. Valkyrie hit a spear. She tried for the road to Valhalla, but Baker spun out into a lockjaw position. She got the lockjaw applied, and she was able to pick up the win. This was not good. This was not good. These two women looked like they were moving in slow motion. I don't know what was going on here. Uh, they were, like, moving in quicksand. Sometimes you, you get two people who just don't work well together. This may have been their very first match together. Uh, in AEW it was. I don't know when else these two would have worked together. It may have just been a case where they just, you know, they, they were not on the same page. I, I don't know. But I just thought this was a plodding, slow match. And of all the times for <laughs> AEW to show this, this is what appeared on screen at the very end of this match here between Britt Baker and Taya Valkyrie. They cut to a sign in the crowd, and no, I'm not talking about the Mario is better than Sonic sign, which is true, but I'm talking about the sign that says, book the women's division better. The timing of this sign cannot be ignored. <laughs> At the end of this Britt Baker match here, book the women's division better. What they need to do First order of business, they need to get Jamie Hayter back as soon as possible. Things have been a hell of a lot less interesting without Jamie Hayter on my television every week. So I hope that she's healing well and she's fully recovered because they need her back so they can start building to Jamie and Tony Storm for Wembley Stadium. So long as Jamie Hayter is, is physically ready to come back, that has to be the working plan, is to get that championship back on her with a big win at Wembley which will be a lot bigger than if she were to walk in there as the champion, had she not been hurt, and just defend the title, retain the title. You know, it'll be a much bigger moment if she goes in there and wins the championship back. So they got to get Jamie Hayter back. We didn't have the outcasts on the show tonight. Neither women's champion was on the show. They have two of them. They have two women's champions. They have a TNT champion, and they have a TBS champion. Neither of whom were on the show tonight. And there really, at this moment here, on this show, are no other women's stories to speak of. You know, you have a, a, a great little run that Athena is having as the Ring of Honor Women's Champion, but Ring of Honor is not Dynamite. Ring of Honor is something completely different and completely separate. And frankly, I wish it wasn't just so that we could get Athena on these shows. Which is why I would not have minded if Athena lost her title to Willow Nightingale last week at Death Before Dishonor, because then that would have freed up Athena after this great run that she's been running through everybody to be promoted back onto Dynamite or Collision, because she's very good. She's one of the, uh, honestly, one of the best women they have signed to AEW right now. 
And I really would like to see her on the main shows challenging for the TBS title and challenging for the uh, Women's World Championship. So, you know, again, I I'm looking at this and I'm agreeing with what the sign said. Could Tony Khan do better with the women's division? Yeah, of course. You bet your ass he could. Absolutely. This match tonight on this show, though, was not the best example to give because this match just wasn't that good. But that's not representative of the entire women's division. And they have a lot of women under contract. You know, the ones I just mentioned are some of the key players there. Jamie Hayter, uh, Athena, you know, the Outcasts have been featured uh, a lot recently. And again, for whatever reason, they were not on the show tonight. Tony Storm is the women's world champion. But yeah, of course, Tony Khan can do a better job booking the women's division and actually putting forth stories that, you know, people might find interesting. You know, take your pick. You know, you've got plenty of women on the roster. Pick half a dozen of them. Come up with some stories for them. Maybe they're stories that don't revolve around the championship. They don't all have to revolve around the world championship. Uh, but it just seems like, especially in recent weeks, you know, he'll find a few minutes to stick a women's match on this show, and it's just not a priority. We had a Britt Baker match last week. You know, last week was all about blood and guts, so we had a women's match with Britt Baker last week, but it was a squ it was a 60-second squash. You know, it was just a way to get her on TV and put her back in the win column because she didn't win in the Owen Hart tournament. Uh, as far as Britt Baker matches go, this was not one of the better ones. Uh, but the timing of that sign was just uh, was too much. The timing of that sign, I have to say, was something else. Now, yeah, I know we have a lot of Sky Blue fans. I see already the Sky Blue comments in the chat. Sky Blue has definitely improved from where she was a year ago. I will say that. Even Julia Hart, you know, when we see Julia Hart occasionally in the ring, uh, she's not in long matches. You know, but she's she's very young, but she's progressing. But they have women who are a lot farther along than Sky Blue and, and Julia Hart. Uh, and I, I only named a few there with people like Willow and Athena and Tony Storm and Jamie Hayter. Taya, they signed not that long ago. God, there's some other women. I, I, I've i forgotten all of the women, frankly, that they have under contract in this company. But needs to put some effort into developing stories for them because, you know, yeah, it's an issue. I can imagine there's a lot of frustration probably in that division. You know, Dynamite is still considered their A show. Even, if, even Collision's been great. Uh, but Dynamite is still the A show in AEW. That's still their... Yeah, you know, their number one sort of bread and butter show. And we're having the 200th episode next Wednesday. 200 episodes of Dynamite. As far as the women go, not a whole lot to celebrate. If you look at the, if you look at this year, because they don't really get that much attention on this show. But uh, they're also short a few people. So hopefully they'll get people like Jamie Hayter back. Thunder Rosa might be uh, coming back. I think in a few weeks she's going to get reevaluated, so we'll see. She'll be on collision, not dynamite, when she comes back. But yeah, that sign was something else. Our main event tonight was a triple threat tag team match. It was the Blackpool Combat Club, John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli, the Lucha Brothers, who lost their Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles last week, and best friends Chuck Taylor and Trent Beretta. Lucha Bros and best friends they started fighting before the Blackpool Combat Club even got to the ring. And so there was a giant brawl to start the uh, main event out. They're just brawling all over the place, which is basically every AEW match. <laughs> brawling everywhere. So they're brawling up the ramp. And they did a spot here where uh, Chuck Taylor and John Moxley, they brawled up the ramp before everybody joined them on the floor. Taylor hit a somersault dive off the stage onto the pile of people. I mean, this just turned into mostly chaos. Late in the match, Penta snapped the arm of Trent Beretta before hitting Made in Penta. Claudio and Moxley broke things up. They beat down the best friends. And Claudio hit a power bomb on Chuck Taylor. Claudio wanted a Ricola bomb, but Orange Cassidy's music hit. And he comes down the ramp. He laid out Wheeler Yuta on the ramp with an orange punch. Cassidy then slugged it out with John Moxley on the floor. In the ring, Trent dropped Claudio with a crunchy, but Paul Turner comes over and says he's not the legal man. And, you know, we, we knock the AEW referees a lot, and deservedly so, because they booked them to look like fucking morons. But 
in this instance, credit to Paul Turner because I have no idea how he even knew who the legal man was. There's just so much going on here in this match. I, I didn't even know who the legal man was. So he's trying to tell uh, Trent that he's not the legal man. And the Lucha Bros jumped in. They laid out Trent with the fear factor. And Penta got the pinfall to win the match for his team. After the match was over, on commentary, they were talking about how the Blackpool Combat Club are in a very unfamiliar position here, having lost multiple matches. And uh, best friends in Orange Cassidy, they were still brawling outside the ring with the Blackpool Combat Club. John Moxley, for whatever reason, just left. While all of this fighting was going on, he's, he just very casually walked over to the, the barricade, jumped into the crowd, and he, he left. He walked. I guess he had enough. <laughs> Maybe he thought they were off the air. I don't know. But he walked out. Excalibur informed us that Moxley, Beretta, and Penta, because he was being told in his ear by Tony Khan, that next week they're going to have a triple threat, anything goes, three-way on the 200th episode of Dynamite. So the Lucha Bros get the win, which is interesting because, of course, the Lucha Bros are part of Death Triangle with Pac. They came out to try to help Pac after the match against Claudia last Friday at the Ring of Honor show. So the Lucha Bros being the ones to get the win here uh, kind of makes sense if you, you know, take them at their word that things are going to continue on here between Pac and Claudia. We haven't seen the last of those two. But still, you know, when this show was over, uh, it just it felt like filler. Yeah, I mean, they moved certain stories along. We got a couple of good matches on the show. But it just felt like they were filling time to get to the big collision show on Saturday. And then the big 200th episode of Dynamite next week. And it was a, a, a big come down from last week. Which it was going to be anyway, because last week you had a War Games match, basically. You know, their big annual blood and guts attraction with all the, all the violence and the gore and everything else. And so this week, it was going to be hard to, to top that. But it just wasn't a very exciting show. Not a very strong show tonight. Now, Rampage on Friday has a tag team battle royal. I shit you not. We have a tag team battle royal. Jay Lethal and Satnam Singh. Big Bill and Brian Cage, Ethan Page and Brother Zay, The Hardy Boys, Butcher and the Blade, Matt Menard and Angelo Parker, Luther and Sir, Luther and fucking Serpentico are in this, whatever. Christopher Daniels and Matt Seidel, the winners get an AW tag team title shot. We just had a blind eliminator tag team tournament. We had a triple threat tag team match here in the main event of the show tonight. We are just coming off a blind eliminator tournament with the winners getting a shot at the AW Tag Team titles. That match has not even happened yet. That match won't happen until Saturday. On Friday, they're already doing a battle royal for another shot at the Tag Team titles. Is there no other way to determine number one contenders other than constant battle royals and tournaments? Is that the only way we can crown Tag Team title contenders in this company? Is this really necessary? We have Ikaru Shida against Nyla Rose, Scorpio Sky against Kip Sabian, and the Kingdom take on, uh, well, we don't know who. We just know they'll be in action. So that's Rampage on Friday. Now, Collision on Saturday has FTR defending their titles against MJF and Adam Cole, Andrade El Idolo against Buddy Matthews in a ladder match for Andrade's mask. How very nice, by the way, of AEW to be hanging Andrade's mask that was stolen from him above the ring. Instead of giving it back to him. But that is going to be the match on Saturday. And we have Vikingo, Action Andretti, and Darius Martin taking on Juice Robinson and The Guns. And then next Wednesday on the 200th installment of Dynamite, Chris Jericho and Kanosuke Takesh to take on Sammy Guevara and Daniel Garcia. Jack Perry goes face-to-face -face with Jerry Lynn. John Moxley, Trent Beretta, and Penta in a Anything Goes triple threat match. That is the Line up for the next three shows coming up for AEW. And here's the Twitter poll for tonight. 57% thumbs up, 42% thumbs down. With uh, nearly 800 votes in so far. So at Solomonster, you can go vote on X. Go vote on X. Sounds like you're on drugs. 
What's he on? He's on X. Ah. He needs rehab. What a stupid fucking name. X. Does that make Elon Professor X? Gonna roll out in his wheelchair the next time he has a big announcement to make? I'm telling you, with Andrade, man, poor guy gets his mask stolen. That's his personal property. And instead of giving it back to him, they're like, we're just gonna hang it from the ceiling. <laughs> we'll just hang it from the ceiling. I know, I know, it's wrestling, but it's still stupid. All right, so let's go through your super chats here. Get those questions on in if you got them. Linklex took gravity long enough to finally remember Pac. Oh, there you go. I've been hearing these jokes all week. Get in on the party. I'm telling you, that's the only reason they did that match. They did it for the jokes. Hey, we got JM with that $100 super chat bomb. Actually, I'm skipping ahead. I missed. I got to go to his 20. He, he got a 25 in first before the 100. So we'll do the we'll do the 25 first. LOL at the close-up of the book the women's division better sign after the Britain tie match. Freudian slip on the director's part. It was a Freudian slip on someone's part. I'll say that. But yes, he dropped the $100 super chat bomb. Thank you so much, JM. You are. The I remember hoping at the time of his contract renewal that Moxley would return to WWE, mostly because I rarely watch WWE and I thought his work was becoming lazy and repetitive. It has gotten demonstrably worse since then. I think some wrestlers need a change of scenery sometimes. Well, you're not going to be getting a change of scenery because he signed that new contract. Was it last year? Was it earlier this year? Five-year contract? Him and Jericho both. Jericho, I think, is locked in until 2026. And I believe Moxley is locked in until 2027. So you better get used to a lot more John Moxley, because he's not going anywhere. Nick Grosso with the 1999. That Brit tie match was not good. This women's division is just as bad as WWE's. And where's the women's champion, Tony Storm? And where is Chris Statlander, the TBS champion? Also, why is Hikaru Shida stuck on Randy? I asked that question earlier. You got two women's champions. They can't find time for at least one of them on this show. Doesn't make sense. Make it make sense. The Redeemer with the $20 super chat. The Redeemer took time away from his hot, flexible wife. Send in a super chat. Balor loses a crazy hard fought match. Priest cashes in on a barely able to stand Rollins and finishes him to win the title. Helps up Balor like a bro. Now Balor is jealous and thinks he finished Seth and Priest stole it. Uh, booking SummerSlam. I floated this idea the other day. I, di I didn't um, advocate it, but I just pitched it. That if uh, Damian Priest really wanted to show his loyalty to the Judgment Day and to Finn Balor, he would cash in his money in the bank when it looks like Balor's not doing too well. He would cash in during the match to make it a triple threat, and he would let Balor get the fall on him. Balor wins the championship, you keep the world title in the Judgment Day, and what, what greater way to show one's loyalty? I wouldn't do that. What a way to waste your money in the bank briefcase. But you know, that's another one though, where there, there are a few potential directions they could go with that, but... I mean, the way they've been featuring the Judgment Day so much lately, it, it sure doesn't feel like they're breaking him up anytime soon. You know, Balor getting the World Championship would make sense. JM with the $60 Super Chat. Here is a little something towards the music budget. You pulled a Tony Khan on us with the music intro tonight. Well, it might not be Tony Khan getting a Final Countdown at Forbidden Door, but... I, I do hope you enjoyed your uh, Racing Queen at the beginning of the stream. St. Clair, huge Solo Monster fan I've been watching since 2015. Hey, St. Clair, thank you for sticking with me now. What is that, uh, eight years? I believe that's eight years. Right. Math is hard. I'm pretty sure it's eight. Uh, Mac says, Yo Solo. 
wondering if you ever listen to uh, third party podcasts like uh, comedians of uh, the comedian just had on Hogan or Rogan having on flair occasionally it I mean I don't I don't listen to all of them but if, if there's one that sounds interesting to me the Logan Paul Logan Paul's has some good podcast he had Rey Mysterio on his impulsive show a few months ago that was really good but I mean would that be considered a third party podcast since he's a, a WWE star now Occasionally, though, yeah, I do. If it's interesting enough to me. Bobbert, thank you for that $40 super chat. Love you, brother. Higato. Gato Otaku Films. You're pretty great, too. Thank you. Uh, we got Dethronic78. Being that there's a major fight this weekend with Crawford and Spence, I don't see Collision really doing well this week. Who's Crawford? Who's Spence? I don't know who those are. Is that a boxing fight? Is that a UFC fight? I don't even know who those people are. Boots. Anyone else think Roderick Strong going to cost MJF and Cole the tag titles and then eventually turn on Cole during his rematch with MJF? It's going to be one or the other. I don't think you do both. That would be repetitive. But yeah, I think I think there's a very good chance that he may cost them the tag titles on Saturday. Uh, we got Dethronic again. Do you think AEW fans will accept why Omega and Ibushi are called the Golden Lovers if AEW showed video packages from New Japan? Would the AEW fans accept it? Of course. The AEW fans would accept it. The, uh, the WWE fans would probably just roll their eyes. The, uh, the AW haters would have a meltdown, but the AW fans would love it. You know, they know who Ibushi is. They know the history between them. Terrence Crawford and Errol Spence. Ah, I see. Terrence Crawford and Errol. Yeah, I don't know who those are. Uh, Paul Carpenter with the five bucks says, How come Tommy Dreamer didn't come out on Jake Perry start crying during a pro... What? How come Tommy Dreamer didn't come on? I thought they said, come on, Jake. Jake Perry? Who's Jake Perry? Is that another UFC fighter? I guess he means Jack Perry. And start crying during a promo. Oh, tell, well, Tommy Dreamer, I mean, he does. Nobody cries more than Ric Flair. But Tommy Dreamer is probably a close set. Yeah, we don't need Tommy Dreamer on, on Dynamite. No, thank you. Uh, naughty delicious chicken with flavor. Here's a weird idea. MJF tries to build his own version of the Undisputed Era in AEW, but he swerves everyone at the end. I I don't think Roderick Strong wants to have anything to do with him, so I don't know how you get there. Drew Johnson. Nick Gage against Jack Perry for the FTW title. Hardcore match. Gage goes over. That would be awesome. Also, HBK is the guy. I don't want to see Nick Gage back on, on AEW. He had his moment. We don't need Nick Gage back on Dynamite. I just got done talking about a whole bunch of people that, are, that have been missing from these shows. <laughs> and never get time on Dynamite. You want to bring back Nick Gage? Come on, Drew. I might book him and be the booker, but... We don't need him back on Dynamite. Oz and Glorious. They've gotten away from what wrestling should be. Solo Monster to the Jim Cornette experience confirmed. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll die on that hill. They have. They have gotten away from what wrestling should be. I think that's a fair statement. There's a lot about wrestling I love. You know? I love, I, I love wrestling, but... Have there been things that they have gotten away from over, over the years? that I think they would be well suited to go back to? Absolutely. Yes, I do. I do miss when wrestling wasn't just for the performance and, and just for the fans in the crowd to hold up signs, you know, 10, eight, basically what it's become. It's like, what was that show, uh, Dancing with the Stars? And they'd have their, their panel of judges and everybody would hold up, you know, the number that they gave the person. That's basically what wrestling is now. I miss the days when it didn't feel like that. It actually felt like you know, you had two guys going into the ring trying to beat the hell out of each other and 
you know, maybe they had some colorful characters in there, and they had all different stories going on, but it didn't feel like it was just about the moves. You know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. I learned that as a kid. Just because you can does not mean you should. Do we really need to see the same moves in every single match? Do we really need to see the same dives in every single match? Do we really need to see the same shit in every single match? And this goes for WWE. This goes for AEW. The answer is no, but we do anyway. We do anyway. Dylan Hensley. The $20 Super you know, that's one of the reasons, by the way, why I love Samoa Joe. One of the best moves in wrestling. It's not even really a move. Literally, Samoa Joe, when he sees somebody diving at him, you know what he does? He just walks away. <laughs> he lets them crash and burn. I love that. It doesn't matter how many times I see him do that. Whether it was in TNA, whether it was in WWE, whether it's in AEW. I love that. It's common sense. Dylan says, today was suplex day. See, Dylan, for those who don't know, is training right now to become a wrestler. He, he is wrestling. Today was suplex day. Vertical suplex, belly to back, underhook, belly to belly, German. I was terrified taking that first vertical suplex. It was scary, but listening to my trainers and using proper form, I conquered my fear. Well, that is very cool. So you're learning. You're learning. See, I'm teaching lessons to Dylan, too. See, Dylan Dylan agrees with me. Dylan, Dylan's just learning the game, right? He's just getting his legs under him, but he agrees with me. What wrestling should and should not be. That's why Dylan is going to... If Dylan is ever going to be a heel, he, when he grows up, right, gets a little older, a little more mature, gets a little more experience, and they say... You're going to turn heel tonight. You know what Dylan is not going to do? He's not going to go out there the very next week and try to pop the crowd to chant, this is awesome. He's going to say, how can I get this crowd to hate my guts? And he's going to figure out a way to get heat from the crowd because Dylan is going to be a great heel. That's what Dylan is going to do. And Dylan is going to keep us updated on his progress here as we go along. Uh, Oz and Glorious, I'm looking forward to Darby retiring or becoming a coach. I'm beyond sick of seeing him multiple times a week on all three shows. Uh, we've got one, two, three, sports talk. Favorite Howard Stern wrestling interview. Favorite Stern wrestling interview. Honestly... I was always uh, surprised by how open Stephanie McMahon was when she was on all those years ago. I don't know that that was my favorite, but I, I remember thinking, how, how Howard, what thing Howard is very good at, or was very good at? I, I don't, you know, listen to his current interviews, so I don't know if he's uh, lost a step. But he was always great at getting people to open up in ways that they would never open up if it was somebody else doing the interview. Of course, he would ask questions that nobody else would ask, but he was very good at that. Interviewing is uh, one of his strong suits. And so he had, over the years, you know, he's had a bunch of wrestlers on his show. Triple H, Stephanie, Vince was on there, Stone Cold. I think Rock was, I think Rock was on there. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was any other wrestlers. Um, like back during that Monday Night War period or the period that came in, Kurt Angle. I think Kurt Angle, unless I'm thinking of a different one, but I'm pretty sure Kurt Angle was on there, and I think that was a that was a good one. But yeah, the Stephanie one was, um, yeah, yeah, she no, she was uh, she, she was very open. Anyway, one, two, three, thank you. Uh, Naughty Delicious says I dare WWE to book a Roman Reigns versus LA Knight program. Yeah, I'm not going to hold my breath on that. Uh, we got Dr. Scorpio. Actually, no, Naughty Delicious has one more. Can you see AEW giving Ricky Starks his own faction? No, I, I would see him linking up with an existing group like uh, Bullet Club Gold. I don't see him starting his own. Dr. Scorpio, now we got to start a solid monster hates modern wrestling agenda. Just couldn't keep it to yourself. For real, though, I do agree with what you said. A lot of people do. I'm sure a lot of people, whether they want to admit it or not, believe me, a lot of people agree with what I said on that. 
Naughty Delicious. I will admit Liv Morgan's injury angle on Raw almost made me cry. Yeah, but not as much as Liv was crying. She's she certainly mastered the art of, of hysterically crying. Selling an injury. I'll, I'll give her that. Bender McSimpson says I could watch Swerve and Darby wrestle every day. Did you listen to Hulk Hogan on Theo Vaughn's podcast? And if so, what did you think? That is the second mention of Theo Vaughn. I don't even know who Theo Vaughn is. Apparently he's a comedian, I, I'm told. No, I did not. But I will ask you a question because uh, since you, I think you listened to it. Did he make any comments or was he asked any questions about uh, Ed Leslie? Brutus Beefcake? Because I saw a video a few weeks ago that Brutus's wife posted on social media. And he clearly filmed it. But she was doing her own Hulk Hogan impression, trying to get him to, like, talk to Brutus again. Like, come on, brother, let's, like, bury the hatchet. and Like, it was the most cringeworthy thing that I've ever seen. And I saw, I thought I saw someone make a comment that um, Hogan was either asked about it or he made a comment about it. Because he hasn't spoken about his, his friendship, his relationship with Brutus in a long time. They had a falling out a long time ago. <clears throat> and I thought they patched things up, but maybe not. I don't know. I don't. I don't think they're uh, they're friends anymore. Still, but uh, did he make a comment on that show about it? Not that I give much of a shit about what Hulk Hogan thinks of Brutus Beefcake in 2023. But I'm mildly curious if he had a response to that video that Brutus's uh, wife put out there. We got Oz and Glorious, Counterpoint. MJF was doing classic slash traditional cartoon villain level heel work pre-Cole. And people loved him and cheered him anyway. Yeah, but that's that's fine. Because you you look. You can't control. You cannot always control how the crowd is going to respond to somebody. If they're a heel and they're trying to be a heel, if the crowd likes that person enough, they're gonna cheer for them anyway. Case in point. LA Knight. LA Knight has been booked as a heel on that roster. And the fans, for whatever reason, all of a sudden, a few months ago, even though he was not being used in any meaningful way, decided to start chanting his name and bringing signs to the shows, and they would go nuts when his music hit. It was nothing the company did. It was not LA Knight going out there and trying to be, you know, a cool baby face. Sometimes the crowds are going to pick and choose and they're going to decide who they like and who they want to cheer for and who they hate, who they want to boo. Dominic Mysterio, they fucking hate this kid's guts. Guess what? One day, Dominic is going to be a great baby face. Today is not that day. But one day it'll happen. MJF. Chris Jericho told them the same thing. MJF was always one day going to be a huge baby face. Tribal Chief Roman Reigns, when this run is over, is going to be a huge babyface, a gigantic babyface. And he'll be a much better babyface now than he was five years ago. But what I'm saying is, again, if you're a heel, there are certain things that as a heel, you probably should not be doing when you're out there in the ring. If the fans naturally gravitate to you because they like you that much, then you're probably not going to be a heel for much longer. But you, you can't always control that. You can only do what you can do. The fans, the fans sometimes can be unpredictable, but that has nothing to do with what I was talking about. Uh, we have got Elijah. Always lover gifting me always lover gifting memberships. I think he meant love. Think? Your thoughts on Blue Cane? Yeah, I keep hearing about this Blue Cane. Is it is it is it just somebody on the Indies dressed up as Cane but in blue? Is that really all it is? I thought Blue Cane got suspended from Twitter. That's all I know about Blue Cane. Saint Clair. Hold on, there's another Saint Clair. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, you got competition, brother. You got another St. Clair here in this chat. Drew Johnson, Solomon, you are the man, but HBK is Brett's daddy. Thank you for everything you do, my friend. 
Today is opposite day. I will agree with you. Thank you, Drew. Paul Carpenter, Heels Season 2 looks pretty good. Anybody going to watch it? CM Punk and Mrs. Punk are going to be on. I believe CM Punk had a cameo in Season 1 as well, right? I, I did see the clip with him and AJ, though, uh, wrestling in the ring. I watched the first two episodes of Season 1, and then I fell off. Uh, not because it was bad, but I, I just I fell off, so... I will not be watching season two because if I'm going to go back to it, I need to go back and finish season one before I can watch season two. Uh, we got Boney. What would your thoughts be on AEW recognizing the FTW title and making it the light heavyweight title? I don't like that idea. I don't like that idea. The FTW title is, is what it is. If they were going to introduce a light heavyweight title, it would be separate and apart from the FTW title. And I don't think they need a light heavyweight title. So I wouldn't do it. Mikey Clayman, buy or sell, Punk 2012 or Cody Rhodes Current? Uh, Punk 2012. 27 at 27, best hometown pop today. Uh, Punk in Chicago or Sammy in Montreal? Sammy in Montreal. Jerome's gibberish. Thank you for the 4.99. Oz and Glorious, Bigger Heel, in current Solomon Monster Verse, Elon Musk, or Eyeball References on Dark Side of the Ring, Elon Musk. There you go. See, that was easy. What's going on, Drew? Uh, Naughty Delicious has a super chat coming in. The Good Sun Scenario. Save one and let the other one go. Brian Myers or Matt Cardona? Well, I mean, you know, Matt Cardona is our world heavyweight champion in Hog right now. I, I don't want to go against the world champ. So, sorry, Brian, but you got to go. And Trill Mexican. Ever since Solomonster got that commissioner gig, he can afford to use the song Racing Queen because what's money to Solomonster? Have a good night. <laughs> and what's what's money to Solomonster? Got to keep the lights on, pay the bills. Just a little minor thing, pay the rent. You know, mi minor things like that. And uh, Drew Johnson, what is your favorite movie of all time? You cannot say Cloverfield. I didn't say Cloverfield was my favorite. I said Cloverfield is one of my favorites. I never said Cloverfield was my favorite. Uh, my favorite movie of all time is The Dark Knight. Die Hard is up there. Die Hard's pretty close. Die Hard may be number two, actually. Uh, but no, it is, uh, it is The Dark Knight. So the uh, goal tonight was 350. We are currently at 389. So uh, thank you for that. Keep hitting that thumbs up. I want to drive this stream into everybody's recommendeds to where they go, what the hell is a Sala monster? And then they click on the video and they find out and then they become part of our little community here. So liking the videos uh, does a lot to help out. But right now, let's go ahead and be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the Booker. Here we go. Be the Booker achievement unlocked. Let's book some matches here as we uh, try to do here on every stream. Rainbow Kane. You know, we almost had great. There was a, uh, uh, a render. Somebody did a mock-up uh, not long ago. Uh, green Kane. That supposedly he was going to wear green gear when he joined DX. But I think that got shot down a long time ago. Just a rumor. Anyway, we begin with Matt Riddle. We got Matt Riddle kicking us off here in Be the Booker. And Matt Riddle is going to be going one-on-one -on -one with Cody Rhodes. It's a match we haven't seen before, right? We haven't seen Matt Riddle and Cody Rhodes in the ring together. That could very well be a match we get on Raw one of these days, since they're both on the Raw roster. Look at that. There's Cody. Cody with his purple tit. 
A match that will stand the test of time. Now we move on to the ladies' side. I, I have to outbook Tony Khan. Can I book a better match than Britt Baker against Taya Valkyrie tonight? We begin with somebody I just mentioned uh, two minutes ago. AJ Lee, the former WWE Divas champion. AJ Lee. This could go either way. It really depends on who the opponent is. But we got AJ Lee taking on, well, there you go. I said it depends on who the opponent is. It could go either way. AJ Lee and Tamina. Let's break the tie. Let's break the tie with the tag teams. Here we go. We begin with Henry O and Phineas I, Hog and Pig, the Godwins. The Godwins. I can already see my finger is, I'm, I'm very tempted to hit the button now, but let's see who their opponents are going to be before I do. The Godwins. Uh, oh, see, this is what makes it tough, man. <laughs> this is what makes it tough. The Godwins and the Rock and Roll Express. Oh, what do I do? I uh, It's the Godwins. Come on. Come on. Even Ricky and Robert. Even Ricky and Robert. Can't make a main event match out of that. I'm sure it would be a serviceable match. But I cannot give that the belt. I know it's blasphemy to give the buzzer to Ricky and Robert, but hey, that's that's the way it goes sometimes. So we uh, end up on the losing side here tonight. And be the but what? Yeah, that is a mismatch. What a mismatch that is, by the way. Talk about two different generations, two different eras. The uh, Rock and Roll Express and the Godwin. Uh, we have got Paul Carpenter. Did Chris Jericho become the guy that he hated the most? Mickey Rourke in the movie The Wrestler. Um, no, I don't think he's there yet. I mean, Mickey Rourke, Mickey Rourke had a heart condition. He was going to die in the ring. I don't. It's not a matter of Jericho dying in the ring. It's just a matter of I think Jericho is someone who would benefit from a break. And going away and coming back and not being on the show every single week. I don't think he's quite reached uh, Randy the Ram territory yet. He, he may get there. He may get there, but I don't think he's quite there just yet. Hey, Brian Alex says uh, you have a good channel. Only good? Why not very good? No, Brian, thank you. I appreciate that. Drew Johnson says The Dark Knight is a masterpiece. Die Hard is a Christmas movie, and my favorite movie is Pulp Fiction. That is a fine choice. Pulp Fiction is another fine choice. Can't go wrong with Goodfellas, right? Goodfellas also a great movie. Turtlehead, with the four ninety nine says Dark Knight is my number two behind Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Both heavily filmed in Chicago. Joker blew up where my mom worked for over 20 years. That's pretty interesting. Uh, Mr. Chicken with Flavor just dropped a five. Matt Riddle against Cody Rhodes. The winner gets to hang out with the Sala Monster. I, I don't feel like Riddle and I would be engaging in the uh, same kind of activity. But I've hung out with Cody before, and uh, we had plenty of uh, conversations, so I think that would be fine. That would be cool. Uh, Shawshank Redemption, also a very good movie. Man, I haven't seen that movie in a long time, but that's, uh, that's a very good one. You know what movie I also like, like really like? The original Scream. The first Scream movie. 
still the best of all those Scream movies they did. But I just, just the vibe, I guess, and, and the, uh, I don't know, just the vibe and, and the whole atmosphere of the movie. Love that first Scream movie. Of course, the original Halloween as well. Can't leave that off. That, that is one of my all-time favorites. The first Halloween from 1978. Solid Monster isn't into porn stars and weed. No, I'm not into weed. Elijah, currently watching my favorite, The Breakfast Club. Yeah, that's not one of my favorites, but uh, yeah, the Breakfast, Cl the Breakfast Club is pretty good. See, I grew up, uh, I was a big fan of the Goonies when I grew up. I'm surprised they haven't remade that since they remake every other fucking movie. Yeah, I, I wore out that VHS tape a lot watching the Goonies as a kid. Uh, the original RoboCop, I just tweeted the other day. I think we hit the uh, 36-year anniversary, I believe, of the original RoboCop from 1987. And uh, I love the original RoboCop. But I will tell you that I should not have seen that movie. I had no business seeing that movie as young as I was. <laughs> because to this day, there are three scenes in that movie that still kind of they still stand out in my mind they really scarred me three scenes in the movie like you might get a movie where there's like one scene that scars you there are three of them in that movie that scarred me for life Let's see if you can figure out which three those are am i going to grand slam uh no as of, as of uh, this moment no i am not but uh but you never know Drew McIncock, my favorite movie is Back to the Future. Another fine choice. Yeah, I never saw the uh, RoboCop. It was a remake, right? A remake or a reboot in uh, 2014. I didn't see I can't comment on it because I didn't see it. I don't have any interest in seeing it. I just, you know, I didn't see the need. The need for, for a remake. I, I heard it wasn't bad. It, it wasn't as violent. But, uh, yeah, the original is, is, can't top the original. You can't top the original. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what the three scenes, okay, what are the, I'll tell you what they were. I'll tell you what they were. Oh, wait, there was another, uh, hold on a second, there's another movie that somebody mentioned. This chat is going by way too fast. Uh, I was going to agree with something that someone said, and I don't know where it went I don't know where it went where did it go somebody had another good one here and I, yeah I don't know where it went uh yeah the Alex Murphy death scene is is obviously that is that is the one that is the one that really really bothered me <laughs> it bothers me honestly even as an adult Imagine watching, how old was I when I watched that? Probably, I'm going to, I'm going to guess I was probably seven or eight, maybe. Probably seven or eight when I saw that movie. The Alex Murphy death scene, the scene in the office where Ed 209 malfunctions and just shreds that dude. And the uh, toxic waste scene. If you know, you know. Those are the three scenes that disturb me. You know what's fucked up about the death of Alex Murphy in that movie? He was assigned to that precinct specifically because they knew he would be killed. And when he was killed... They would be able to use his body for their little RoboCop project. So, from the moment he got assigned to that precinct, he was a walking dead man. That's what's fucked up about that. <laughs> Get off me, man! Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, that was... That scene was something else. That scene was something else. Uh, 
Yeah, LaShawn, I didn't know you were such a uh, Maki Ito fan. I don't even know what her theme song is. Uh, Drew Johnson says, Stu is the best character. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. It was fun. It was fun. Yeah, Stu. Stu from Scream. Did you really call the police? My mom and dad are going to be so mad at me. It's a great movie. <laughs> it's a great movie. Oh, man. Naughty Delicious is Hollywood. Please don't remake Escape from New York. I saw Escape from L.A. before I saw Escape from New York. And I, I like Escape from, from L.A. I'm not telling you, I'm, I'm not saying it's a great movie. I'm just saying I like it. So. But yeah, I mean, if I, it's hard for me. I don't want to start ranking them. But if I had to make a top five um, all-time favorite movies, again, Dark Knight is, is probably number one. But Die Hard would be on that list. The first Halloween would be on that list. And The Thing from 82. Uh, would also be on that list. LaShawn says, need Sheeta on my TV right now. Also, I sent... Uh... No, I did. I I just mentioned it, LaShawn. Again, the member the, the member chats, I try to grab and mention if I can, but they, they don't pop up in the window with the super chats, so those don't always get read, but I do see them eventually. But yeah, Sheeta, hey, you want Sheeta, you got to watch Rampage. You want Sheeta, you got to get her on Rampage on Friday against Nyla. Training day, yes. Training day. Training day was very good. Training day was very good. Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop 2. Planes, trains, and automobiles, says the Winston Slip and Dumb and Dumber. I was never a fan of Dumb and Dumber. Planes, trains, and automobiles, though, is a, it's just a classic Thanksgiving movie. I, I usually watch it every Thanksgiving. Either it comes on cable or I, I find it somehow. And it's always very emotional in that scene at the train station at the very end. If you've seen the movie, you know the scene. Naughty Delicious says, every time I watch RoboCop, you you look like a younger Peter Weller with lots of hair. No, I don't. Peter, Peter Weller had an amazing jawline. <laughs> I don't have the jawline that he has, but thank you anyway. Base beer is God of Seduction. Can't wait for the Summerfest. That's right. Summerfest is a little over a week away. About a week and a half, right? Nine days, maybe. Is it nine days? I think it's nine days. Nine days. I think it's nine days away. Hey, speaking of nine days, where's Food Hive? We haven't heard from Food Hive in a while. Might be in a food coma. Uh, have I seen the Killers of the Flower Moon trailer? I have not. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, you know, the original 12 Angry Men, very good movie. And I saw the 12 Angry Men that they did with Jack Lemmon. And uh, well, there, there were a bunch of actors in that one. It was just, uh, Jack Lemmon, I think, was the foreman. Uh, James Gandolfini was in there. Tony Danza. That one was also really good. So if you've never seen either one of those, uh, 12 Angry Men, it's 12 jurors. It's, it's literally them in a jury room. That's the whole movie. Uh, but those are both very good. Bulu. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Bulu, Bulu was gone for a very long time. And then Bulu reappeared. For, for a while, for like a couple of streams. Like Bulu Fatulu, and then he just vanished again. So wherever he is, I hope he's doing okay. Buffman Entertainment. The Summer Slam is next week. Oh, that's right. It's you gotta say it the right way. It's the Summer Slam. It's the Summer Slam coming up next weekend. LaShawn says I watched Grayson on Out of Character, and he definitely seemed to still be playing it up. Probably the most honest that we will see him. Talking about uh, Grayson Waller. Grayson Waller is still talking about The Rock. 
He's still talking about The Rock. He wants The Rock on his show. I'm telling you, something's cooking. Something's cooking there. I'll make a prediction right now. I predict that it, at SummerSlam, at the SummerSlam, Grayson Waller is going to have a segment. I don't know if it'll be his talk show, but he'll have a segment at SummerSlam. And it will be with either The Rock, The Undertaker, or Stone Cold Steve Austin. Since he seems to be working with different legends. The Rock is the one he's been calling out. Rock would make the most sense. Uh, plus, Rock is probably a little less busy these days with the strike going on. So, Rock, Undertaker, who is going to be there. Undertaker's going to be in town. He's doing one of his one one dead man talk shows. And, uh, and then Stone Cold, I think, would also be a possibility. Because Stone Cold could get physical. I mean, we saw the shape he was in at the beginning of the year when it looked like he might be at WrestleMania. And he claims the only reason he wasn't is because he was busy, he had something else going on. It'll be one of those three. I think Grayson Waller will have some kind of segment with one of those three. Uh, Creepshow, yes, thank you, who said that? Art King, yes. Creepshow is one of my favorite movies as well. Creepshow is, Creep, Creepshow is a good one. Uh, worst movie I've ever seen, says the Winston Slip. He says his is... The English Patient. I didn't see The English Patient, but I did see... Um, oh, God. What was that movie? With uh, John Travolta and Forrest Whitaker was in it as well. It was a space movie. Oh, my God. I forgot the name of it. That was the worst movie I ever saw. That movie absolutely sucked. Uh, base beer is God of Seduction. Oh, Battlefield Earth. Thank you, yes. Thank you, EJ. Battlefield Earth. Hot garbage, that movie was. Base beer is God of Seduction. Thoughts on House Jack Bull. Hostel House? What? Wait, what? House Jack Bull? Oh, Built. House Jack Built? I've never seen that. Uh, Hostel... Yeah. I, 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 didn't, I didn't like Hostel. Uh, Hereditary... Oh, God. Hereditary. Yeah, I think I saw that, but it was so long ago. I don't remember much about it. The Descent was pretty good. Yeah, the, the, the torture porn stuff, as far as, like, horror movies go, there were a few that I liked. You know, the, I, I thought the original Saw movie was actually brilliant. Um, and there have been a few good ones, but not, nothing like the original. But some of these movies, and, like, the hostile ones, I mean, some people might like that stuff. Some of the ones where it was just torture and gore for the sake of it, I just, I don't like that, you know? I just, it, it just turned me off. Uh, Maze the Great, you're not just the solo monster, damn it. You are the building me up. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Jared Mysterio. Mysterio with the $10 super chat. Who's that jumping out the sky? It's Mysterio. Jared Mysterio. EJ Slamp. Killers of the Flower Moon is the new Scorsese movie with both Leo and De Niro. It's about the... Oh, okay. Is it Osage or Osa Osagi? Osa Osage tribe murders in the 1920s in Oklahoma. It looks great. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was the name of the movie. Uh, I will have to uh, see the trailer. I have not seen the trailer for Oh, the hill, the hills have eyes. Yeah, man. I mean, there there are some movies that just they bother you. Hills Have Eyes was one of those movies. Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of those movies. It just it bothers me, and I hate that because even after the movie is over, like it just it haunts me, and I can't get it out of my head. And I've seen different versions of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I saw the original from seventy seventy four. 
There was one they did in 95 that had Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey. It used to come on cable at night, like, all the time. Back when I had cable and I had all these bullshit movie channels I rarely watched, I'd be up late. It'd be, like, 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm flipping through, like, Showtime 6. <laughs> Fucking Cinemax 3. And, of course, Shannon Tweed was always on Cinemax. But that movie would come on all the time. So, you know, I'm laying in bed. It's pitch black, right? It's late at night. And I'm watching this movie, and it's like, I couldn't go to bed after that. You know, it's just, it's, it's just stays with you, you know? Uh, Speed was very good. I did not see Speed 2. I did not see Speed on a Boat. Whichever one that was, was, was that 2 or was that 3? I only saw the first one. Never saw the Resident Evil movies, believe it or not. I quit, by the way, the Resident Evil games. I think it was Resident Evil Part 2. And uh, there was a scene where I I got, I was in a hallway. I opened the door, and now I'm in a hallway of a house. And there's windows. But the music stopped. And that should have been a dead giveaway that something was about to happen. But I guess I wasn't expecting it. And all of a sudden, a dog. I don't know if it was like a Doberman or what. Like jumps through the window i scream like a girl i never played the game again <laughs> that was it i never played another minute of resident evil after that i'm pretty sure it was part two but again i don't remember all i remember is that fucking dog jumping through the window and i shrieked and i said fuck this game and that was the end of that that was it for me speaking of uh that being it for me there's a uh, couple of Sound Off gamers that are in the can. I just have to uh, edit. But uh, the uh, the 2K23 one, there's a WWE one and an AEW one. The WWE one is probably going to be the last one you're ever going to get from me. So, And you'll see why when you watch the video. Talk about Rage Quit. You wait until you see that video. Uh, Naughty Delicious says, Rush Hour movies were funny as hell. No Holds Barred. No Holds Barred is a guilty pleasure of mine. I like No Holds Barred. Trey, Trey, Trey you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea what I went through. You'll, you'll see. You'll see in the video. Were, was I at the police station with a zombie dog? Maybe, maybe it was a police station. I don't know. All I know is that I was in a hallway and a dog jumped through the window and that was, that was it for me. <laughs> at that point, my Resident Evil days were done. And I never, I never went back. Daddy Ugarte in the chat says, <laughs> Solid Monster. Solid Monster took his boots off in 2K23. No, I took my boots off and I, I put them up someone's ass is what I did. Tired of it. Fuck that game. Fuck that game and fuck everybody who made that game. That's it. I'm done. All right, this has been fun. Good, good talking. Good movie discussion here. I enjoyed that. Uh, don't forget to, uh, go back and check out the Raw review from Monday night if you missed that. Of course, we have SmackDown coming up on Friday. And, uh, of course, episode 819 of The Sound Off on Sunday. I watched the Dark Side of the Ring episode on Bam Bam Bigelow today. I enjoyed it very much. And I will have a lot to say about the episode. Of course, I always try to inject additional stories and information into these reviews. And uh, this will be no different. So there'll be a, a nice big review for the Dark Side episode coming up on Sunday, plus all the usual uh, weekly news as well. What did Andre say? <laughs> Jobbed out to that one dude at the PC. Yeah. Hey, 
anyway again uh, you guys keep your eyes out because those uh the the 2k23 game i think i'll put that one up first i'm saving the aw one for next week i want to stagger them i don't want to put them out at the same time but uh, keep your eye out there'll be more gamer content coming very soon as well all right i'm out of here i'm gonna go get some sleep i will see you back here live right back here on friday night for the smackdown recap until then take care guys